Welcome to the Bullington Capital Report, hosted by Bill Bullington. For the next hour, you will receive information on current market conditions and trends that could affect your financial future. If you have a question for Bill, you can participate in today's program by calling 216-901-0945. That's 216-901-0WHK. You can also reach Bill by going to his website, BullingtonCapital.com. So without any additional delay, here's the host of today's program, Bill Bullington. Welcome back. Glad to be back. On the road a lot this week. Yeah. <laughs> oh, got a lot of cool things going on, I think. Uh, we've got the seminar coming up on Thursday. So if you haven't signed up for that, you might want to get to this one. I think there are 35 seats remaining. Yes, 35 seats remaining. And we're going to be talking about momentum investing, the other side of value. So momentum investing is nearly the opposite of the value side of investing. Uh, and they both work. Over time, they both work pretty well. And so I think it's important that you have a little bit of both in your portfolios. If I were to choose one over the other for ease, I would say momentum is a lot easier. And we're going to talk about why. Anyway, that's going to start at 7.30, and that's this Thursday, uh, October 6th. It's the Corporate College on the east side, 4400 Richmond Road, Warrensville Heights, right over there, right next to the Big Eaton uh, Complex. You know, their headquarters, which is not their headquarters, or at least it's not supposed to be because their headquarters is outside of the country, so they don't have to pay as much in taxes. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but it's their headquarters, the... Uh, Nobody gets mad at me over that. Anyway, um, yeah, it's going to be, we're going to actually do a, a pre-seminar seminar at 6.30. We're going to talk about individual stocks. This is a really good time to be talking about stocks. And everybody's worried, the election come up. That's good. When people are happy about the market, it's typically because the market's reaching all-time new highs and is up a whole lot. That's not good. <laughs> You want to get things before that happens, and there are so many things that are that are coming into place. Got a change in the presidential office. I don't care who it is. It's probably going to speed things up. There are lots of projects that have been held up that are going to get released. So whoever's in charge is going to get credit for it. Yeah, it doesn't really matter, and uh, that's a good thing. Uh, on top of that, if you look at, oh, let's just take a look at Russell 3000. Russell 3000 has large cap, small cap, and mid cap stocks in it. In fact, it makes up well over 90% of all the uh, stock market value in the United States. And I'm trying to pull this up right now, and it's my computer doesn't want to help me. So here, uh, wow. Well, I'm going to just pull up the fund okay, instead of the index itself. The fund doesn't have the dividends reinvested. That's a big difference. So if you go back and you look through 2014, okay, that's coming up on two years now. 2014, the price of that is only up 3%. Price is only up 3%. It's been down about 10%. It's been down more than 10% during that time period. So all you've gotten is this really long, choppy period. And that's a good thing. Why is that a good thing? Because the economy, it's definitely grown. The companies that make up the Russell 3000 are doing more business than they were a little over two years ago. Their profits are definitely higher than they were two years ago. They definitely have more cash on their balance sheets than they had two years ago. What am I saying? I'm saying that there are an awful lot of undervalued stocks. Now, if you're looking at the S&P 500, it's a different story. S&P 500, the, the top 50 stocks by size, the, top, the 50 biggest stocks, make up an, uh, an unequal proportion of the performance of the index. Those stocks are not underpriced. They are not underpriced. Those are the stocks that have just gone up the most. The ones that people are kind of clamoring in, they, you look at the flow of funds coming in and out of funds, they're all going into those funds that have those 50 stocks in them because they have done the best over the past two years. That's about to change. I don't know exactly when. If I did that, you know, you wouldn't be allowed to talk to me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Kind of. But I don't know exactly when that's going to happen. I just do, do know that it, it's 
likely to happen sometime soon. The momentum investing has been out of favor now. Since that time, and during that time period, momentum investing has not done well. Look at John Marsico's assets under management. He ran the Janus 20 fund. Anybody remember that? That fund was on fire back when it was small and, and easy to manage. When it got really large and hard to manage, he left and started his own firm. His own, he got up to $100 billion in assets at his firm because he was a good stock picker and his style had been in favor and got up to $100 billion in assets and now he's back down to about $3.5 billion, still a lot of money, but it's not $100 billion. And he's actually taken uh, and paid off a large portion of his company's debt with his own personal money. So he believes in it. He knows what I know. We all know. People who have been in the industry for a long time all know. Momentum investing is very cyclical and when it's in favor, you're going to wish you had some. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> no, just kidding. Yeah. When it's in favor, you're going to wish you had some. So put a little bit of your money in there, and I'm going to show you the, uh, the strategies we use for LinkedIn Capital. I'm going to, one of the strategies I'm going to let you take home with you, I'm going to print it out for you, give it away on a piece of paper, and it's one of the ones that I use. And uh, I like it a lot. Has it underperformed? Yep. Just like most momentum strategies have. They've underperformed, which doesn't really bother me. I and mean, it's difficult going through. Don't get, don't get me wrong. It's difficult when you're undergoing one of those periods of performance. You're just like, oh, jeez, you know. And earlier in my career, I probably would have given up on it. Actually, I'm sure I did. I know I gave up, gave up on at least twice over the past 30 years. And then uh, watched it. As it started to come back, I added to it. Missed the first you know, two or three weeks, which incidentally, you don't, you don't want to be doing that. That's why I don't do that anymore. You don't want to miss the first two or three weeks because it can be up a lot. In fact, one day last week, one day, and I have to go back and look at the exact day, but one day last week, that strategy was up 5% in a day. Now, 5% in a day for a stock is nothing, but for an entire portfolio, that's a lot. That's a lot. So that whole portfolio was up 5% in a day. <laughs> there are 40 stocks in that portfolio. So 40 stocks collectively moving up 5% in a day? That's crazy. The, uh, but that's how it is. That's how that works. And I'm going to show you that. So feel free to go to my website, bullingtoncapital.com, to sign up online. There's no cost to attend. Seating is limited. Corporate College does a great job with all the refreshments. They put out some healthy choices as well as uh, some really tasty choices. <laughs> I was going to say not so healthy, but they're actually uh, very, very good there. In fact, they, they do it there. A couple four and five star chefs that work there now. I don't know if you've been there you know, since they made that movie uh, for Kevin Costner, which incidentally was right across the door. His office was right across the door where they set it up on the set. It was right across the uh, um, the hallway from where we're do ho hosting the workshop. So it's fun. It's free. Getting handouts there. It's a, uh, a good time. So you can go to BullingtonCapital.com to sign up. 35 seats left. And uh, don't worry. If the 35 seats go because of uh, a promotion today here on the, on the radio, if they go or uh, when we don't have them, we still have some more. So I always keep a little bit in reserve. I'm kind of like the uh, Boy Scouts. Try to be prepared. <laughs> so if you go to the website to try to sign up and there are no more signups, just call us because uh, chances are we still have at least 15 seats left. So anyway, if you'd like to call in today, 216-901-0945, 216-901-0945. That's the radio station's phone number. Feel free to give us a call, ask any questions you have. The uh, We'll see what we can do to help you out there. Oh, and by the way, the uh, uh, I, I got to backtrack a little bit. The first part of the seminar, we're, so we're going to be talking about um, individual stocks. Over the past you know, two and a half years, as markets basically just treaded water and gone sideways, there is a uh, there have been a lot of changes going on with a lot of companies that have not been reflected in their share prices, and I'm going to show you the ones I'm looking at, and we'll show you the ones I'm investing in personally. 
we're going to talk about how to do that. I think everybody, I, th- I think really everybody should be managing a small portion of your money, even if you don't have much interest in it. If you don't have much interest in it, don't, you know, don't manage more than 5%. That way you won't hurt yourself too badly. Uh, if you have a lot of interest in it, I still don't think you should be managing much more than 25% total. Unless you're, you know, unless you're retired and you can spend all your time doing it, then great. You know, then you can manage more than 25% of it. But I just don't think it's a good idea, just from a safety standpoint. And I think it is a good idea that you do some of it. Because you, then you get an appreciation for all the things that, that I talk about here on the radio. I've been talking about for, I can't, close to 20 years, I think. The, uh, yeah, oh my gosh. That's unbelievable. I just thought of that. My first show was in 1996. <laughs> I'm getting old. <laughs> 1996. Holy cow. That was a great time for Momentum Investors, by the way. And that was easy. Four year, five years, actually. Five years momentum investing was a cinch. Yeah, you had a couple of hiccups along the way. NASDAQ dropped 20% in April of 1997. Remember that one well. The uh, 1998 long-term capital management blew up and nearly took the entire financial world with it. The S&P dropped 22% in a little over a month. I remember that one really well. <laughs> so even when it was easy, it was still hard. <laughs> But, uh, but you learn how to make it. You learn how to make it. Yeah, and there are always opportunities. Whenever you get those big drops, some stocks always drop more than they should. In fact, that happens constantly. Bad news comes out, stock drops. If it's really bad news, or if the bad news is expected to persist for over a year, that stock's going to get kiboshed. And that is where the opportunity for the long-term investor, kind of the uh, value-oriented investor. It's not momentum. That's why I'm breaking them up into two parts, by the way, because I'm going to talk about long-term investors. I'm going to talk about how to maximize that long-term investor uh, perspective. So in long-term, I'm typically looking at, I'm going to try to time this up, by the way. The, uh, I'm going to try to get to within 12 to 18 months of the turnaround. I'm looking for a catalyst. Those stocks that have been beaten down, I don't want to buy them while they're on their way down. Because they may, you know, keep just keep dropping. In fact, oftentimes they do. They just keep right on dropping. So I want to wait until I've hit the bottom and have started to bounce. Then I want to look. And if they're underpriced by a lot, well, there are some ways that you can maximize the return if that stock recovers. Or instead of doubling your money or maybe making 150 or even 200%, you could make if you were to make 150 percent return on the stock, you could actually make 10 times that if you were buying a long-term uh, equity anticipation note. It's called a leap. It's, it's an option. And we're going to talk about that. I've got a couple of those that I'm I'm involved with right now. I'm not allowed to do that for individual clients, by the way. So this is something that you will have to do for yourself by yourself, unfortunately. But you'll have my help. I'll have you uh, looking at, and uh, we're, re- we're going to revive the Lookout for the Bull website. I've got somebody in the office that can uh, actually handle that now. I was trying to handle it but myself before. It got to be too much work. Just couldn't do it, couldn't get to it. And uh, so this is good because these types of opportunities come along, and uh, I'm like a kid in a candy store. I look at it and go, oh, you know. And if I don't have any available funds to invest in, I may have to sell something to buy one of those if I really like it. But the uh, oftentimes I just can't I can't buy all the ones that I can find, and then other times I'm looking around for things and can't find anything for months. So <laughs> that's just kind of how that goes. Uh, but it would really be helpful, I think, for people to know how to identify this and how to kind of find a, how to follow the market without having to read the Wall Street Journal every day because that thing is mostly poof, uh, puff, poof. Either way, <laughs> I got to take a real quick phone call. 216-901-0945 if you want to call in. And I got John. Hey, John, how you doing? Good, Bill. How are you? I'm doing really well. Okay. Hey, uh, a couple of weeks ago I talked to you, and we talked about you, you suggested uh, a ETF, the MLPN, which is a uh, master limited. Yeah, that's an, uh, that's an uh, ETF. ETF for master limited partnership. Yeah, that's an yeah. ETN. There's a difference. 
Um, it trades just like an I ETF, though. Huh? It trades just... Oh, it's just, an ETN. Okay. Yeah, right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let me ask you this. I thought of another question about it. Now, that's run by Credit Suisse. Mm-hmm. Now, I have known Credit Suisse, and it hasn't done very well and um, as a stock. And I'm wondering if that were to... If they were to clear ch- Chapter 11, what would happen to my... You would be at the top of the list of the creditors standing in line. So the chances of you not getting your money back are fairly remote, but there is a chance. Uh, yeah. You wouldn't take a huge uh, hit, more than likely. But, yeah. uh, but you know, you have to understand that, yes, that is a risk. That uh, yeah. if, if Credit Suisse were to file for Chapter 11 reorganization, there's a pecking order into who gets what. Yeah. And the commercial paper, the stuff that the super short term, that has a tendency to take precedence over everything else that gets paid off first. And yeah. then they go down uh, the list to see what the order of preferences are. Now, the preferred stocks get paid off before common stocks do. Uh, yeah. Common stocks are last on the totem pole. You go up uh, bank debt. A lot of the banks do their short-term lending even to each other. Those are the uh, uh, typically the highest on the pecking order. That's that's where the exchange traded notes would fall. They would fall under that. And uh, see what they're doing. They're they're buying those securities and they're holding them, and they're issuing basically what amounts to an IOU. So they're just tracking the value of those securities that they're holding. And that's what you're buying when you buy the uh, ETN is really an IOU that says, okay, you guys are holding this for me. You're the custodian, and I have claims to this number of shares. And uh, uh, so those typically are uh, uh, safer than other types of investments. It's safer than the company's bonds. And, and what about the company's stock? A lot safer than that. Safer? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're those, that, that's, those are the low boys on the totem pole. The stockholders are, uh, they're the ones that are taking all the risk. And yeah. rightly so, because if the stock does incredibly well, they're the ones that make all the money. <laughs> so yeah, 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 yeah. Switch off between the yeah. risk and reward there. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Well, appreciate your input. I mean, you look at this particular uh, investment and it's been pretty stable. You know, it just. Yeah. It, it, hey, it, you want to hang on, John? I got to take a real well. quick uh, commercial. Well, I'm, I'm, that's that's pretty much it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Bill. Thanks. Listen to Bill okay. Bullington right here on 1420, The Answer. Whoa. And we're back. Just, just lost my whole train of thought there. <laughs> Listen, we're talking a little bit about the uh, workshop coming up. It's actually on Thursday. Uh, there are two parts of it. You can show up for one or both. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the first one's going to be at 6.30. And we're, really, really, we're going to be talking about individual securities, how to identify <clears throat> quickly the, uh, the relative potential there. So when I say relative, it means you know, relative to other companies. And um, that's a pretty good way of doing it. You know, it's kind of like shopping for real estate. You know, you want to find out what the average price per square foot in the neighborhood you're interested in is so you can make an accurate comparison to the house that you're interested in. And it's very similar to with stocks. And uh, so we're going to talk about that um, special situation, how I look for uh, long-term equity anticipation notes. Those are long-term options. Uh, When you should look for them, sometimes you're better off just buying the stock. Sometimes you're better off buying the leap. And uh, those are... A lot of fun. They can be extremely profitable, or you can lose 100% of the money that you put into a leap. By the way, so you need to know that. Uh, if you're not, uh, if you don't know that, you will after the seminar. <laughs> so, you really want to look for those high probability events, and they're out there. They haven't been that numerous the past couple of years. They're more numerous now because essentially the Large cap stocks are basically flat. Small cap stocks are below where they were. Mid cap stocks, a lot of the, they, they, there's been no love there. Past two years, actually, there's been a lot of volatility. Those uh, small mid cap indices last year were down at one point in time 25%. Uh, 
let the S and P go down twenty five percent and see what people's moods are like. Yeah. So anyway, and, and all this stuff I think is is going to change. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast. Markets never stay exactly the same. There are an awful lot of things that that have been uh, put off, delayed. They're actually going to start coming to fruition now. Economy should start to grow a little faster. And uh, if for no other reason, then we've been below average for so long. You know, the average growth rate the U.S. economy is actually 3.5% a year, according to uh, the stats I pulled up from a company called Y-Charts, by the way. We've got economic data going back to who knows when. Uh, it's a very cool program. They've actually got a, uh, a version for retail investors. Uh, if you wanted to look up a lot of that data, you can go and check it out for yourself. You could do it on Google, too. It just takes a little longer. Uh, you spend a little time, but 3.5% long-term average, that's average. Now, occasionally, that growth goes negative. Sometimes the economy, actually, the economy's grown, grown by 8 or 9% at some point in time. So long-term average, 3.5%, what does that mean? Uh, it's just a number, really. The, uh, we've been below that number for the longest number of years back-to-back in the history of the country. Eight years Low average growth. So again, uh, if reversion to the mean means anything, we're due. It's not like we don't have the projects. It's not like we don't have bridges that need fixed. I just drove across across the uh, Cincinnati Bridge yesterday. Holy cow. That's a little spooky. <laughs> Looking down, you see all the rust. <laughs> wow. And the only consolation is, is you're not going to suffer for long if that, <laughs> if that thing goes down. But uh, so there are lots of places like that. There are lots of jobs. Lots of jobs need done. A lot of these projects have already been funded. They haven't released the funds. Release those funds. Whoever's in office at that time is going to get credit for it. And they had nothing to do with it, but they will get credit for it. I don't really care as long as it gets done. Let's just start doing things. You're hurting everybody by holding this stuff up. It's Congress and uh, Senate, they're the ones holding this stuff up. You know, it's just, it's, the politics have gotten uh, out of hand. To be able to, to keep the economic growth down as low as they have for as long as they have, it, they've got too much power. We need to do something about that. But uh, anyway, I guess I shouldn't complain too much because it has created some opportunities. There are companies out there that are selling well below where they would normally sell. Well, and when I say well below, I'm talking at least 50% below where they would normally sell. And that's what I like to shoot for. If I'm looking at money from my own personal account, uh, the money that I'm going to manage myself, the value-oriented strategies, I am not interested in something that is not selling at a, at least a 50% discount. I'm just not. Oh, so that's what we're going to look for. That's what I'm going to try to teach you. How to find a company that's selling at half or less of what it should normally sell for. So for all you shoppers out there, people that love to that, that refuse to shop unless something's on sale, well, you need to get to this workshop because <laughs> this is right up your alley. Yeah, you want to buy something at minimally half off. I like it better when it's seventy five percent off. That way your your margin for error is humongous. You come out and buy a company and you pay full price, or you pay more than you normally should and expect to make money real soon, well, that only happens if you get really lucky and people, you know, it's called the bigger fool theory. Other people have come in that are paying more than they should and are paying more than you paid uh, because they basically don't know how to evaluate what a fair price is. And there are an awful lot of large company, large popular stocks that are selling slightly above where they should that make up a, a huge chunk of the S&P 500 and at some point in time, that comes home to roost. Those companies will not hang out there forever. When they start to come down, that means the S&P 500 gets to do what the Russell 3000 has done over the past couple of years and go choppy sideways, probably for two or three years. And uh, that's why I would be leaning away from that and leaning towards doing a lot of the other stuff that I'm talking about. Styles come in and out of favor over time. That one's about to go out of favor. Don't know exactly when. My instincts tell me that because you've got a change in the White House, that this presents an opportunity to trigger that event. 
And it's just a change. It doesn't matter really who gets in. I think just the, the fact that it's changing is more important. And when you've been doing this for a really long time, that'll uh, start to make sense to you too. Well, anyway, uh, anything that you would like to talk about, <laughs> feel free. Actually, you can email me, bill at bullingtoncapital.com. Um, I'll go check my email during the commercial break, by the way. And you can email. I can talk about it on the radio here today. The uh, I won't talk about politics, by the way. The politics, kind of like the uh, you know, voting for a head coach. Is it important? Yeah. But there are a lot of other things that are just as important. And having a good head coach doesn't guarantee that you're going to win, especially when your general manager keeps drafting people that you, know, you can't use. <laughs> Remember the Cavs back in the day? <laughs> Cause LeBron to get up and leave. The uh, uh, the, there are more parts to it. More things have to be working, and I think we're getting closer. Uh, I like what I see. I like what I see economically. I like what I see developing. A lot of money out there. A lot of industries that people are not that familiar with yet. They will be. Watch what happens to the uh, electric utilities over the next ten years. Um, They are transforming. You don't hear much about that, but they are. They are transforming, and it's going to be a, a new future for them. Uh, I think it's going to be profitable. I think they'll be prosperous. Yeah, do I want to go out and put all of my money in there? Nope. <laughs> I already have some money in there, and it'll always be there. And it's going to ro- rotate towards the higher valued, the more the, the more valued companies, or I shouldn't say more valued, the companies that are scaring people right now. <laughs> Ones with the highest dividend yields. That, that's where I like to go with that. So, and there's a there's a method to that madness. So don't go out and run out and buy a whole bunch of utility stocks. Saying Bill Bullock has said, you know, there's a method to my madness, and, and that's something that uh, everybody needs. Uh, again, we're going to be talking about that the, the workshop. You've got to have methods. Why do you need a method? Because trying to think about something, when you think about everything else you're doing in a day, trying to think about something and come on coming up with a a good conclusion with all the emotional stuff that you see here and read on a daily basis uh, coming up with a, a good objective conclusion to an investment is incredibly difficult and you normally don't do that except by luck I mean unless you've been doing this for an incredibly long time period and are really good at it it's typically a bad idea you normally need rules to follow they should have, it's my opinion. You should have rules to follow so that you're not thinking about what I need to do. You're actually doing it. Not thinking about it, you're doing it. And you've got to understand, I guess one of the tough things that, that I deal with is, is people still have this feeling that they're going to be able to somehow forecast the future accurately, whether it's an individual company, whether it's the economy, whether it's politics, And if you actually started writing down your thoughts, kept a journal, you know what? You would stop doing that. Um, I think we got a phone call. uh, You would stop trying to project out into the future because you'd see how horrible you are (laughs) at actually predicting the future. It is a bear. It's a tough, it's an incredibly tough thing to do. Um, Anyway, if you'd like to call and ask a question, it's just you lost my train of thought here. There's, uh, you can call us 216-901-0945, 216-901-0945. You can also reach me in the office, 330-664-0700. That's 330-664-0700. Or you can email us, go to my website. There is a contact us page there. And uh, you just click on the contact button there. It'll take you to this page so that you can uh, uh, ask questions. And I'll try to deal with them on the radio. Oh, I just lost my internet connection. What is up? But I'll come back to that in a second. <laughs> right now I'm going to go to the phones and uh, Chris in Brexville, you had a question? Yeah, I was wondering about two stocks that have been beaten down. Um, maybe not as far as you like. Bristol Myers and uh, Gilead, which you, I think in the years past you used to own. I don't know if you still do. Um, it's been in and out of, uh, actually that one's been in and out of the momentum model multiple times it, it's been pretty good too the uh what, gilead or bristol uh gilead um yeah. bristol meyer is uh that that's really a tough one i just uh i lost my internet connection and i'm not sure why so i can't pull it up 
in uh, probably the Russians. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably something like that. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's just my. Well, I think uh, we didn't we turn it away. Well, maybe we just turned it over to somebody else's control now. No, that's Isn't the. Uh, that coming? Yeah, Isn't no. that coming? No, <laughs> absolutely not. You really think the CIA would allow that? <laughs> I don't or know. NSA? Every day I, read, I hear it's coming any day now. Yeah, well, you know what? You you read, you stay on the internet long enough, and you it's just like looking at clouds. You look at a cloud long enough, you'll find any object you want, and you go out on the internet, and you can find at least a half a dozen people that will agree with just about anything you will say, and it doesn't matter what it is. You'll find a, at least a half a dozen people that will agree with it, with just about anything. Oh, uh, let's see. Well, of the two, Bristol now is uh, somewhere from a dividend standpoint is, is like 2.75 or 3 or something like that, I think. So yeah. the dividend is getting a lot better than it used to be. That's okay. You know, it's uh, it's okay. To make a, a long-term projection on a stock like that, you really need to go back, look at what the company does. Uh, and here's, here's one of the things that's really tough. When you're talking about trying to predict the future, You've got a company who is extremely uh, highly influenced by the United States government and by European authorities. They're under controls. Those controls are set by the government. Have they done well? Yep, in the past they've done well. But uh, I don't know if people remember this or not. Last time, you know, when Clinton got in in his first administration, they went on a warpath against the big drug companies. Those stocks dropped like rocks. I mean, yeah, that's they, when I bought Bristol. It was a six percent dividend and twenty two dollars a share. Yeah, and did you do you know that nobody that worked at Bristol when you bought it that at that time works there now? Not a single okay, solitary right. soul. They sold wow. the name. The companies changed. They bought divisions, uh actually they were bought by other divisions from a German company. I can't remember what it, I think it might have been Bayer. But the the only thing that's the same about Bristol since that time period is the name. That's it. They held the name because they know that people have an affinity to the name. Oh. And it's not the same that's business. Okay. So that's it. And that's what I mean. Uh, you know, that's why in investing that way where you're actually going, it's called value investing. That's what you're basically trying to practice there, uh, is incredibly difficult, especially when you're looking at a company the size of a Bristol Myers Squibb and who is regulated uh, you know, up to their gills by government agencies. That is an incredibly tough thing to do. And uh, uh, I just, I kind of stay away from that. Warren Buffett's got this thing, this uh, folder holder on his desk and he's got a big title on it that says too hard. <laughs> I would put that in the too hard file. That's what I would put it okay. in. Now, if it comes up on one of my screens, that's a different story. It has to meet certain criteria. And the only reason it's in there is because it met the criteria, no thought process from me other than setting up the criteria initially, which is, you know, you should be spending a lot of time thinking about and not as much time thinking about executing the strategy. You want to pay attention to the process, not to the results. You start looking at the results and I, I'm going to tell you, you're, you're going to abandon the process right before it takes off. Because all strategies end up frustrating you so badly at some point in time, whether the momentum or value oriented or a blend of the two in between, that you're going to be frustrated. And typically, when you're at your peak level of frustration, ready to do something about it, is about the time that it starts to kick back in favor. <laughs> and I don't know why it works that way. I guess the uh, um, you know, God just enjoys that. He, he's got a good sense of humor. <laughs> well, what, let me ask you this. As we get near the end of the year, you always hear about these these portfolio shifting by these big guys. <laughs> I mean, yeah. what are what where they go from one uh, one uh, class of business to another where where it's you know something out of favor. Let's say the drug stocks are out of favor. Now all of a sudden, at the end of the year, they get in favor because they've been beaten down so much. I mean, does well, that what? really take place? Does this really mm, take place? It doesn't happen like that. The uh, you're much more likely to if you're looking for quick profits. Um, hey, you know what? Can you hang on? Because I got to take a commercial break. Sure. Okay. Sure. Right. You're listening to Bill Bullington right here on 1420 The Answer, and we're going to come back with those answers after these commercial messages. And we're 
we're back. Hey, Chris, you still there? Yep. Hey, yep. my uh, my internet connection came back up, so this is good. Um, so Bristol Myers' revenue tw- past twelve months was seventeen billion. Uh, it was up seventeen percent year over year. That's a good number. The uh, still music playing in the background. Oh, thanks. <laughs> the uh, new board operator. Anyway, the uh, uh, market cap, that's the market value of the stock, is $90 billion, uh, which is, uh, makes it kind of high. Uh, it's about five times its uh, revenue. So it's not a bargain at these prices, just, just based on the numbers. Okay, that's not the company itself. Just based on the numbers, it, it's not really a bargain. Uh, if it were, uh, I don't know, probably... 30, 40% lower than it is right now, I'd be going, hey. And actually, I promise you, if it were at that level, it would be in my dividend model. And so at some point in time, if it, you know, something happens or, you know, if Clinton gets in and decides to go on the warpath again against the drug companies, they, you know, you're going to find some really good values there the way that you did last time. <laughs> but it could take a very long time for that to work out because that is the, you know, that's the old buy low, sell high. And oftentimes when you're buying low, you're typically not catching the bottom. You're buying it after after it's down quite a bit, and it may keep dropping. So uh, you got to be right. careful with that. But uh, but I like the company. I mean, uh, you know, you can't. The drug companies provide an enormous amount of benefit overall you know, to society. The uh, in uh, they are very profitable typically. Like the gross profit margin for these guys, seventy five percent. That's huge. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's like tech. Oh, it is. <laughs> it absolutely is. In fact, they are like tech because you look at the actual materials that they're using to create these drugs, it's not that expensive. It's no. the research and development that's that costs so much money. Once they get, uh, you know, once they're producing, it's a lot easier. By the way, their net profit margin was 23, almost 24%. That's huge. Okay, that's huge. Okay. So, uh yeah, I, I don't think there's anything right. necessarily wrong is, and if if I were to invest in it, I would just reinvest those dividends. And if the stock started going down, I would just buy some more of it. At least, uh, you know, from this point. Okay. Do you have any drug stocks in your dividend pro? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's about ten percent. Ten percent of the portfolios in uh, drugs. How about, how about I, Pfizer? Um, I like Pfizer. It's been in and out, and it's it really depends on. Right, the current dividend yield. Uh, if the current dividend yield is in the, uh, if it's one of the top four in that sector, then I'm going to hold it. So I know both Pfizer and Bristol Myers have been in it before. So I typically, again, uh, if there's another drug company that it has a higher dividend yield, I'll typically swap one for the other one. But that you know it doesn't happen all that often. And I know when they are in there, uh, they typically I'll, I'll end up holding them sometimes for several years in a row. Uh, but if they get so high that the dividend yield comes down, that that's a, a, a kind of a good way to tell uh, what the valuations are. The higher the dividend yield is, the lower the valuation is on the company, and the more attractive it becomes to my model. So uh, um, it's one of those things. Hey, one, one last question. Sure. Um, do you really think these guys can raise interest rates? No. <laughs> I don't either. No. <laughs> It's, you know, you got way too much debt to be able to do that. If you were to raise interest rates, you know, you're talking hundreds of billions of dollars in extra payments the United States government has to make, and they're already running at a deficit. So I just can't, you know, I, I don't know where they go from here. Uh, they can't come out and tell you what I just said because then people, you know, they would risk igniting higher than average inflation, which is an extremely damaging event to an economy. Yeah, so they don't want to do that. So they're always going to oh, yeah. play the, the kind of the cat and mouse game and say, you know, well, we're thinking about raising them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't believe it, not at this point. Yeah, I don't either. And that's why I, I don't understand why some of these high higher dividend stocks fall like, like uh, you know, that, I was thinking like the same AT. thing. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. When I mean, if, AT. Yeah, ATT, which are going to wild, I mean, it's still paying. It's like four point nine percent or something. Yeah, it's been in my uh, dividend model for a long time. It's been a a very good uh, provider too. Uh, that thing's done in, yeah. incredibly well. So, but yeah, I like it. But I, I really like uh, uh, most most old economy dividend paying stocks. 
I'm kind of a fan of because of what you just said. They're not going to be able to raise interest rates uh, anytime soon. Okay. At some point in time, and this is my biggest fear, at some point in time, the investing community across the world goes, hey, you know what? You're right. Interest rates are not going up. Let's just buy stocks. The S&P yeah. doubles. Everybody is extremely happy. They're selling everything else and putting it all in the stock market at exactly the time they should be taking it out. <laughs> That's my fear because I'm going to look like an idiot telling people, hey, yeah, I know they're not worth it. I know what you're saying. I see how well they've done. They're not worth what people are paying for them. The same thing I went through in the year 2000 with the technology stocks. The, uh, uh, and I got hate mail. <laughs> I got hate mail. Because, you know, I was basically saying, you know, yeah, this is great, but these stocks are not worth what they're selling for. And eventually that comes home to roost. And eventually it does. You just don't know exactly when. But right now we are nowhere near that level. Not even close. So that that makes me feel a whole lot better for the next four or five years anyway. And uh, you know, unless the market doubles in one year, which has never happened before, but <laughs> but could, I guess, potentially. Yeah, the Browns might win three Super Bowls, you know, in a row too, but. Yeah, Mike, you could have a relief rally in November. <laughs> yeah, you know what? A, I, a, a, a relief that the election's over. <laughs> yeah, the table's been set. The fourth quarter, by the way, has always been the best performing quarter. So, you know, right. that's, you, know, you okay. get a lot of got a positive things coming. So, it could easily. Okay. All, All right. right. Well, now, hey, when you say old economy uh, dividends, what do you mean? By, do you mean like? Well, Coca-Cola they're not. Or? They're yeah. Uh, uh, companies that uh, have been around for a long time, you know, been around for at least 20 years minimally. The uh, uh, new economy would be things like Twitter, you know, Facebook. Uh, those stocks are not undervalued by any stretch of the imagination. Well, I, they, I, don't, I don't know why Twitter's worth anything. <laughs> well, you know what? Yeah, because yeah. of the eyeballs. And, and it really, they're just guessing. And yeah. Disney thinks that maybe they can come in or some other companies think that they can come in. They can take that audience that Twitter has has gathered. They do have a huge number of users, and they think they're going to be they're going to be able to come up with a business model that will monetize that will that will convert that into a cash flow. And good luck. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they can. I hope they can. I uh, hope somebody yeah. does. I just know I won't be interested in. It. Other than a, a trade, I I would take a trade in a stock like that. I would not be a long term investor in it. Because uh, that's just too hard. Yeah, well, I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't own it. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just, like I said, I, I and, think what what happens when these companies that make bids bid lower than what the stock's worth right now? Yeah, so, um, then they get a problem. They yeah, it up too hard. yeah, that that could happen, uh, no doubt. But anyway, I better let you run. I got to take this other guy's okay. phone call. Ha- you. Have a good weekend. All right, bye. Right. Thank you. And I've got uh, friend Daryl Broadview Heist. How you doing? I'm doing terrific. How are you? Oh, pretty good. Hanging in glad there. Glad to hear it. Glad, I'm glad to hear it. Hey, I was tied up with some clients over here uh, earlier in your show. Um, I was concerned, or not concerned, but curious about the Deutsche Bank, the German bank thing. Um, what was the issue, and why did it affect the market so much? Um, I think the, uh, um, in a second. Oh, the issues were, uh, it's a big bank. It's a part of this um, worldwide banking system, a major player. And they were afraid that if they had uh, big problems, came up short, kind of like, you know, Lehman Brothers or AIG, they're, those weren't banks. But, the, well, Lehman Brothers was an investment bank. But the uh, um, whenever something like that happens, it causes a cascade of events until the federal in uh, uh, the equivalent of the federal institutions across the, the world can step up and put a stop to it, which they can. They can stop that. They, they did it the last time. They, they've done it every time, actually. Uh, how long it takes will typically affect how far the drop in, in stocks is going to be. And uh, it's a, uh, so it's, a, it's kind of a scary thing uh, for a lot of people in the uh, financial and banking and you know, a lot of these funds, people people assume that a professional portfolio manager, you should see the the revolving doors uh, prof- of professional portfolio management as a career. 
People come in and go out a lot. You don't hear about that. They'll come in and like they're baseball. Yeah, at worse than yeah, baseball. Like baseball. Yeah, it's actually a lot worse <laughs> than baseball. The turnover is much greater because they'll come in, they'll they'll panic, they'll do something they shouldn't have done, they'll sell or or buy something they shouldn't have purchased. Uh, it blows up on them, and now they're looking for another job. They don't really care because they got paid so much while they were <laughs> while they were there. But uh, um, and it, it's just it's um, um, unbelievable. And you're expecting. And, and, and ex- expectations from a lot of these quote unquote professional money management firms, I mean, they're worse than the public is. Yeah, it's unreal. And uh, Fidelity is one of the few. Uh, Fidelity, there's a few out there. Uh, Vanguard tends to be pretty patient with their active managers. Uh, they tend to uh, put them through some pretty strenuous tests before they allow them to manage money, which is a good idea. <laughs> Yeah. And you would think that I'm, I'm telling you, you would think that that would be kind of the norm. And I guess for the large part it is, but there's still a lot of firms that'll take some kid who they think is a genius and, and give him a bunch of money to manage it. Come on, be come be the next Peter Lynch, and, and then as soon as he uh, makes a mistake, boop, you know, he's doing something else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, and Peter Lynch made a lot of mistakes, by the way, and uh, they just uh, his his the times that he made money just outweighed the mistakes that he was making. So. Yeah, and he, he admits to that yeah, like, you know, freely. Hey, we got to like get out. Strikeout. What's the name of the website we need to get people to go to? We need to send people to Nutriskis.com, N-U-T-R-I-S-K-I-S, like nutrition and skis combined. You just All right. Um, <laughs> Nutriskis. And, uh, yeah, I appreciate you getting letting me mention that. And uh, they want an opportunity for a home office mini outlet. Um, we right. can help him coach him through that. Um, Sounds good. Very little hey, risk. Hey, I'm going to have to run. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right. I've been listening to Bill Bullington on the Bullington Capital Report here every Saturday morning from 11 to noon on 1420 The Answer. Have a good week, everybody. Good luck and good investing. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. Therefore, no current or prospective client should assume that the future performance of any specific investment, investment strategy, including the investments and or investment strategies recommended and or purchased by advisor or product made reference to directly or indirectly will be profitable. Different types of investment involve varying degrees of risk, and there can be no assurance that any specific specific investment will either be suitable or profitable for a client's investment portfolio. No client or prospective client should assume that any information presented serves as the receipt of or substitute for personalized investment advice from the advisor or any other investment professional. The preceding program has been paid for by Bullington Capital Management, LLC.